Welcome, sisters and brothers, to this Trinity Sunday service at the Hackney in Stoke Newington uh, Methodist Church Circuit. God calls us in this moment. Jesus welcomes us to this moment. The Spirit unites us in this moment. Come and worship and let us pray. Loving God, as we gather in this moment, we celebrate your welcome. Speak to us. Challenge us. Reassure us. Take what we offer in worship and praise that your name may be glorified now and forever, Father God. You are full of joy and love. You delight in the world you created. What love you have for us all created in your image. We love you and adore you. What delight you have in the Son, who is all that you are, and who you sent in love in order that we may be in relationship with you. We adore you and glorify your name. What joy and pleasure you had in sending your Holy Spirit to guide us in all truth and make you known to us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you all glory. Amen. Let's sing, Father, we love you. Sing the faith number six. Father, we love you. The time that we spend examining, taking a look into our hearts to confess our sins, that doesn't mean that we have to feel guilty and unforgivable. It's the time when we make a commitment with God to try to get better, to trust in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to 
regret about what we've done that make other people hurt and sometimes ourselves. And it's a time of commitment also to say, I will try to make it better. So let's confess our sins. Lord God, we come to you now to say sorry for all the times we've been less than truthful in our relationships, including the one with you. As a consequence, we often miss out on your joy. Lord, please forgive us. Lord God, we are sorry for ignoring or being dismissive of others and of you, for not always wanting to hear or acknowledge your truth. Lord, please forgive us. Lord God, we are sorry for the days we spend remembering and living in past experiences rather than living now with you. Help us to focus on our relationships with you now. We need to be forward, thinking but not to the point of missing out on your unfolding truth today. Lord, please forgive us. Amen. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ, who died, that we may live, we stand in God's grace. Absolved from guilt, we stand forgiven, rejoicing in the hope and glory of God. Amen. Today's reading from the New Testament comes from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. We have been made right with God because of our faith. So we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our faith, Christ has brought us into that blessing of God's grace that we now enjoy. And we are very happy because of the hope we have of sharing God's glory. And we are also happy with the troubles we have. Why are we happy with troubles? Because we know that these troubles make us more patient. And this patience is proof that we are strong. And this proof gives us hope. And this hope will never disappoint us. We know this because God has poured out his love to fill our hearts through the Holy Spirit he gave us. Amen.
Today's Gospel reading comes from John chapter 16, verses 12 to 15. I have so much more to tell you, but it is too much for you to accept now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will lead you into all truth. He will not speak his own words. He will speak only what he hears and will tell you what will happen in the future. The Spirit of Truth will bring glory to me by telling you what He receives from me. All that the Father has is mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will tell you what He receives from me. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Amen. Despite the incredible capacity that our brain has to process reality, we have to be humble and recognize that God does not fit into our brain. Therefore, it's certainly not worth trying to define what the Trinity is, but is worth deepening our understanding of God's action in this three-dimensional world with high, breadth, and depth. If we admit our limitation and consider the possibility of the existence of other dimensions besides these three in which we live, we will accept that the Trinity is part of the universe of faith and goes beyond the limitations of the three dimensions, dimensions we know. It's not by chance that the first Sunday of Pentecost is dedicated to the celebration of the mystery of the Trinity. The period of the great Christian feasts closes with a common vision of the revelation of God. The incarnation of God at Christmas, the death and resurrection of the Son on Good Friday and Easter, and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost identify the God who gives meaning and direction to our life. Christianity speaks of the triune God, who is at once Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is what we remember this Sunday. But why do we speak of God in this way? For many people, this talk is scandalous. Christianity would be transforming monotheism into tritheism, worshipping three different divinities as another monotheistic religion usually accuses us of doing. To speak of the Trinity means that we are not stuck with the question of who God is. We are interested in what God has done, is doing, and will do. We proclaim an acting God, that is, a God who creates the universe and every living thing, who has compassion on creatures, who comes close to people, who forgives their debts, who snatches them from the clutches of death, who sends his spirit to guide his people. This is why we have to speak of the same God three times, namely of his acting as creator, as redeemer, and as guide. That's Trinity. And it in no way harms monotheism. Rather, it shows us the merciful face of God, who loves the unworthy creature and wants us to live. Where else can we find such a speech? It is quite true that the New Testament 
does not yet formulate a dogma in this regard. That happens only later in the life of the Church. Even so, the Gospel is essentially Trinitarian in nature. This is confirmed by the Gospel reading proposed for today. It does not speak directly of the Trinity, and yet no one will understand it outside of that horizon. John 16 verses 12 to 15 is part of the block in which the evangelist gathers together the so-called farewell discourses of Jesus, which covers chapters 13 to 17. Jesus is on his way to the cross, and soon the disciples will no longer be able to count on the physical presence of their master, and will have to deal alone with a hostile world. Yet there is no reason for resignation and despair. For Jesus promises then the sending of the Spirit of Truth, the Helper, the Comforter. Through the Spirit, Jesus will make himself present and assist his followers. Jesus still has much more to say to them, like we can see in the verse 12. But at this very moment, they cannot yet bear it. There are things they will understand only after the crucifixion and resurrection. That will be one of the great works of the Holy Spirit, namely, to lead the disciples into all the truth, so that they will understand what Jesus has done for humanity. At the same time, he will announce to them the things that are to come. So the Spirit directs our gaze not only backwards, remembering all that Jesus said and did, he also points to the works foreseen by God in the future. This means that the Holy Spirit is not nostalgic. The Spirit remembers the story of Jesus, yes, but the Spirit does not get caught up in it. It gives eyes to the promises of God, just as Jesus had already done. The Holy Spirit gives reasons for hope. In all this, he glorifies Jesus, that is, he gives him reason. He makes his word count. He confirms his work. This work, moreover, is the work of God himself. For just as Jesus did nothing for himself, but on God's command, so too the Holy Spirit. He will not speak for himself, like we see in the verse 13, on his own authority, as if he were someone else. He will speak in the name of Jesus, just as Jesus spoke in the name of God. For all that the Father has is Jesus's, and all that the Holy Spirit announces he receives from Jesus, like we see in the verse 15. Therefore, the unity between the Father, Jesus, and the Spirit of Truth is inseparable. I want to emphasize that the Spirit is of the Truth, not of post-Truth. Post-Truth is what occurs, is what happens when people nowadays react more to emotional appeals than to objective facts. The truth of facts is put on the back burner when information appeals to the beliefs and emotions of the masses, resulting in manipulable public opinions. The term post-truth was voted Word of the Year in 2016 by the Oxford Dictionary in which it was defined as the idea that a concrete fact 
has less significance or influence than appeals to emotion and personal beliefs. According to the dictionary, the prefix post conveys the idea that truth is left behind. It was this trend that favored the election of Trump in the United States. The same phenomenon occurred in this country and resulted in the opinion option, sorry, and resulted in the option for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union, the Brexit as it became known. By referring to the spirit as the spirit of truth, Jesus through the Gospel of John, offers help against the evil of disorientation. Religious confusion is great in our days. Alongside the unbelief of some, we find legitimate religious fervor and also fanaticism. This is nothing new. Already in the times of the New Testament, the most varied faiths competed in the religious market, most of the times with clear economic interests. Today the situation has worsened. The electronic means of communication and global information may have contributed for that. Which religion or even Christian denomination should we follow? Are they all equivalent? The affirmation of normative values has become difficult. Every, everything seems to be reduced to a particular option. As Methodists, however, we are called to study and proclaim the Word of God, seeking to guide people in matters of faith and conduct in a time of religious pluralism. If, if we no longer seek to be guided by norms dictated by the ancients, we rely on divine inspiration that places principles and values to guide our actions. The epistle to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, takes as its starting point the justifying action of God in Christ so that, through faith in Christ, we can have peace with God and stand firm in that grace. However, the life of faith does not consist in an uninterrupted succession of always pleasant experiences, through which you can exult and boast. Rather, Glorying is only in the hope of God's glory. That is, the Apostle Paul is very realistic about the condition of our present existence. It can bring tribulation and temptation. It may bring a burden of sufferings. In any case, no one escapes human limitations and minor or major personal failures. Still, we need not waver. We can stand firm in God's grace and peace. And the hope we have is not illusory, but consistent because it is anchored in God himself. Thus, sustained by that hope, tribulation produces perseverance, and that brings experience, in which hope is strengthened. Thus, finally, our passage so realistic with the human condition, even of those who have come to faith, does not cease to be optimistic. It will not result in lamentation, but in exaltation of the glory of God. And now I ask you, 
How is your relationship with God? How is it possible to have peace with God if in life we so often have to go through difficulties and tribulations? Rising cost of living, monkeypox, authorities who make laws and disrespect the laws that they themselves created. Very conscious of the tribulations that did not spare him either, the apostle Paul first characterizes this new way of living as being in hope. Three times in this short passage, Paul speaks of hope in the verses 2, 4, and 5. In a certain sense, hope is both the point of departure and the point of arrival in, of Christian life. It comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ and is sustained by the Holy Spirit. Hence, he affirms in verse 5, hope does not disappoint. On the contrary, we are steadfast in the grace of God. Let us resist the temptation of try of trying to explain the Trinity. Since the early centuries, the Church has struggled with the precise meaning of this theological concept. By freeing ourselves from this expectation to find meaning in the Trinity, our community can engage in experiencing the Trinity. That's where the doctrine comes from anyway, from our experience of God and the experience of God's people from the beginning. Let us trust in the Father's protection. Let us follow the Son's teaching. Let us trust in the Spirit's guidance. Amen.
Let us render our prayers of intercession. And our response today is going to be, and we pray for your healing. So let us pray. Holy Trinity, we bring to you in our prayers those whose relationships are breaking down. And we pray for your healing. We think of relationships that have gone wrong and have caused division and bitterness. And we pray for your healing. We think of relationships between nations where there is tension and mistrust. And we pray for your healing. We think of our relationships where we feel inadequate or helpless or used. And we pray for your healing. And we thank you for your relationship with your world and with your church and with each one of us. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer in the modern form. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. With us creates a Father, bringing everything to birth. Mother of the whole creation, fire of stars and life of earth. Down the countless years composing, from the earth's evolving night, love's response to love and warming light and soul. a donation to one of our churches in the circuit, you can find the bank account details at the end of this service in one of the screens 
And also you can visit our website and then you can find the bank account details. And I invite you to join me in this prayer offering our lives to God. Let us pray. Mighty God, who is both one and three, we praise you as God above us, God beside us, and God within us. We bring our gifts to you in worship and gratitude as our creator and provider of all good things. We acknowledge that our relationship with you in all three persons begins and ends on your side of the equation, beginning with your devotion and not our own, beginning with your wisdom and not our own. We come into relationship resting on your grace-filled love and not our intermittent efforts to be faithful in our love for you. Bless these gifts we give and bless the transformational impact they might have. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
let us pray our closing prayer and be blessed. Be in our homes that we may know your peace. Be in our hearts that we know your love. Be in our lives that we may take the challenges you present day by day. May God protect you through your time of trial. May the love of Christ, seen in what he did and heard in what he said, fuel you, fill you with joy and hope. May the Holy Spirit advocate for you, leading into all truth, lighting the way of faith, and strengthening you to follow Jesus so that you will become like a strong young tree, growing deep and bearing much fruit. And the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, have you all a wonderful and blessed week.